My pregnant wife was admitted to Gimli Hospital in 1999 for a routine induction, and I haven't seen them since. Here's what happened. We came in. A doctor, Dr. Madden, checked my wife and assigned her to a room in the birthing ward. For a while, her labour progressed without problems. Then it stalled. Something about her contractions being weak and dilation stuck at 7 centimetres. Dr. Madden suggested upping her dose of pitocin. When I asked what that was, he gave me a look and explained that it's a hormone, the artificial form of oxytocin, which speeds up contractions to help women deliver more quickly and safely. Apparently my wife was getting it already. He just wanted to give her more. She didn't protest. Although, to be fair, she'd generally been receptive to everything since they'd given her the epidural. Before that, she had been screaming. Dr. Madden asked me if I wanted things to go smoothly. And when I said yes, he punched something into the computer in the room. The one monitoring my wife's vitals and playing the constant hypnotic swoosh swoosh sound of my baby's heartbeat. And then he left. But before the door shut, I heard him tell someone in the hall to go down and extract more of the hormone. I was tired, so part of me figured I might be hearing nonsense, but I couldn't understand why they'd be extracting anything. So I pressed my ear against the door and heard someone else, a nurse I presumed, say, depleted the current source. Do you want me to remove another tile? I knew I hadn't heard that incorrectly. So with one last glance at my wife, peaceful, beautiful, I stepped into the hall myself. Instantly, Dr. Madden's eyes widened and he asked, Mr. Crane, may I help you with something? As the person he'd been speaking with turned and walked away, she didn't look like a nurse. I told Dr. Madden I only wanted to stretch my legs and continued in the same direction as the disappearing non-nurse. When I was out of Dr. Madden's sight, I sped up and managed to catch a glimpse of the woman I was following just as she stepped into an operating room. After a slight hesitation, I followed. The room was empty, and the woman crossed it to another one, and another after that, before finally entering a hallway, which ended on a set of dark doors, behind which, once she'd pushed them open, was a stairway leading down. She didn't appear to have noticed me following her, so after waiting for half a minute, I went down the stairs too. Immediately, I felt like I was in a place I didn't belong, witnessing something I shouldn't be. The walls, which had started as bare concrete, soon became carved out of rock and the lights became further spaced apart, creating longer and longer stretches of darkness between islands of light. A few times I nearly tripped and fell, catching myself at the last moment. I knew I was making a lot of noise, but I didn't care. I had even stopped paying attention to the woman I had been following, distracted by the realisation that as I'd begun to sweat, the tunnel itself sweated too. Liquid, I hesitate to call it water, 
which seemed as if excreted by the walls themselves, reflected the infrequent lighting unnaturally, and gathered, dripped, making the stairs slippery, causing my shoes to slide over them. Eventually the stairs ended, and I found myself in a large room, which had also been carved out of rock, and whose floor was a pattern of hundreds of alternating black and white tiles. Some of them had been removed. The woman was kneeling, and using a crowbar to force off one of the tiles that was still in place. Her efforts echoed throughout the room. I was maybe 15 steps away from her when she managed to dislodge the tile, revealing beneath it a deep, writhing darkness that looked as if space itself had turned into reptilian skin. I managed to call out to her. I awoke with a throbbing head, lying in a hospital bed, and Dr. Madden's face smiling at me. Mr. Crane, he said, as I blinked him into focus. I am so very glad to see you awake again. You appear to have taken quite the fall, ending with a nasty blow to the head. Where's my wife? I asked him. In the birthing room, he assured me. And don't worry, you haven't slept through the big moment. Is she okay? He seemed taken aback. Of course. In fact, she's doing very well, and her labour is progressing splendidly after her new dosage of pitocin. I leapt out of bed. Or tried to. I was restrained. For your protection, Dr. Madden said, explaining that because of my head injury, I could be concussed, confused, or unstable, leaving it ambiguous whether he meant physically or mentally. I ordered him to release me. Very well, he said, and motioned toward a part of the room I could not see, and from whose unsighted dark corner the woman I'd been following emerged, carrying a syringe filled with the same black substance I had seen below the dislodged tile. No, I protested. Not that. I, I don't want that. No need to be hysterical, said Dr. Madden, taking the syringe. There's no reason for us to give you Pitocin. Then, much to my surprise, he undid my restraints and allowed me to run out of the room. I was in an unknown part of the hospital. I tried to catch my bearings. I tried to find a sign, anything to help me navigate and return to my wife. But there was nothing. The walls were bare. What's more, in whatever direction I tried to run, the hospital itself seemed to fade out of materiality, its transparency falling enough to reveal, behind the walls, a starscape. I was hyperventilating. I was in a wheelchair, rushed into an operating room, the same one I'd passed through earlier, but this time it was prepped for a procedure. I was lifted out of the chair and placed onto a cold table. Above me there was no ceiling, only stars embedded in writhing reptilian skin which descended, and when I shut my eyes in terror, instead of darkness, it was my wife's hospital room I saw, and Dr. Madden standing beside her, and my wife was giving birth. 
but as she did, her skin darkened and thickened, and she became unhuman, and the baby, crowning, was something else entirely, something horrible, something alien. I barely evaded the 18-wheeler, which roared past, honking. I was crawling along the dry, unpaved shoulder of a highway. The sutures ran down both sides of my face. My head was shaved. I hadn't had sutures. I had had hair. When I looked around and saw the empty field before me, I remembered that there'd been a hospital here. Gimli Hospital, where my pregnant wife had been admitted for a routine induction in 1999. I stepped into the middle of the highway, stopped a car, and asked what day it was. February 29th, 2024, the petrified driver told me. 25 years. What about the hospital? I asked. What hospital? She said. There was no hospital here, and never was. Later, when I had regained more of my senses, I did research, and discovered that, indeed, there had been no hospital there. As for my wife, I learned from my grieving in-laws that she had died in a car accident in 1999 she had been pregnant. I had been in the accident too, and survived. But ever since I had suffered bouts. But ever since, I had suffered bouts of delirium, and entered into confused states, in which I talked endlessly about Gimli Hospital and other insanities. Perhaps I would have believed them, if not for one thing. Several weeks ago, I came across an online story, written by someone trapped inside a hospital. You can't imagine how my mind convulsed when I read that this was Gimli Hospital. A hospital which, in their words, exists only if you believe in it. Since then, I have found several more references to Gimli Hospital, and disappearing hospitals more broadly. Recording this is my attempt to force my mind to remember. But maybe if I remember, the rooms, the layout, the smells, the sounds, I can make the place manifest again. Maybe my wife is still there, still giving birth. Maybe not. Maybe she was abducted. We were both abducted. There may be aliens here on Earth already, buried underneath, living and using us to breed. If only I could find more evidence. If I could get my hands on that black substance and send it to a lab for analysis, then they'd confirm it wasn't of this world at all. I don't believe my wife had been cheating on me, as my mother-in-law once told me. I believe that the night sky is descending, slowly imperceptibly. Sometimes I have nightmares that I'm driving, my wife beside me, and suddenly, suddenly I turn the steering wheel, and the impact of the 18-wheeler wrecks my sleep, and I find myself awake, once more, following a woman I don't know, down empty hallways, and through operating rooms, downstairs, 
and to the place with the alternating black and white tiles and the horror stuff beneath. Hello, sinister listeners. If you've enjoyed this story, then you'll find all the author's information in the description below. For more content, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to succumb to the sinister. <laughs>